Well, good afternoon. I hope you've had a good week. Uh, today we're going to look at Peter's Denial, a very familiar story, but I hope that we can get something out of it and see if we're not just as guilty as Peter. I want to take you back to the third century after Christ's um, death, and there was a brutal persecution by Christians during this third century, and here's the two sides of it and see what you would have thought. There was one side that Christians had publicly offered sacrifices to pagan gods to show their loyalty to Rome and to avoid persecution. So they had been kicked out of the church. Well, some believers said, especially those believers who had lost family members, said they should not be allowed back into the church. Other believers said if you had offered a sacrifice to a Roman god, un even under the threat of death, you had denied Christ as your Savior, and you had no part of the church. Others said, but if you repented, and it was a true repentance, then you should be welcomed back. So think about that in today's terms. If you knew a member of Ottawa Baptist Church and they had publicly denied that they were a Christian, they had publicly denied that they were a member of Ottawa, and then they came on Sunday and they repented, they asked for forgiveness, they stood up in front of the church and they, you know, expressed their regret, would you welcome them back? Tough question, isn't it? Okay, I want you to fast forward to October the 1st of 2015 in Southwest Oregon. It was a community college. There was a guy came in the community college by the name of Harper Mercer. And he asked the students sitting in their class, are you a Christian? Stand up. Those that stood up, he said, you're going to meet your God in one second, and he killed 10 of them. If you had been sitting in that classroom, could you have stood up and knowing that you were facing death because of admitting or professing that you were a Christian? Open Doors in 2021 in World Watch has reports of Christian persecution around the world. And they said from October 19 of 19 to, I mean, excuse me, from, um, yeah, October the 1st of 19 to September the 1st of 2020, on an average, there were 13 Christians being killed every single day because of their faith. And really, they said, went on to say that there were a lot more than 13 because many countries, namely North Korea and Somalia, persecuted Christians that they knew about, but they were not recorded in the deaths. So it's going on. It's going on more than we would ever imagine in our world today. We can look at Peter's denial of Christ and we can put ourselves into Peter's shoes. We can read accounts of Christians being persecuted around the world, and we can think about how strong they were in their faith. Would we be willing to do that? Would we stand strong the way they would, or the, the way they did? But yet at the same time, we also know there are probably many Christians who did not stand strong in their faith, um, but yet their stories aren't told. Well, Peter's story was told. Peter boasted that he would never deny Jesus, but Jesus warned Peter that the devil would get a hold of him and would sift him like wheat, and that Peter would stumble in his faith. But Peter didn't believe that. Peter said he would not deny that he was a follower of Jesus, but we know that he did. So when we look at this story of Peter that is so familiar to us, it warns us of how easy it is for us to stumble because we think that our faith is so strong and that we were are, are just against denying Christ, but yet we can fail just like Peter did. 
So we want to look at how, what can we do to help our faltering faith? There are three points in this lesson that show us characteristics of God that comes through so strongly. The first one is his amazing grace. The second one is his enduring love for us and how he forgives us. And the third one is that when we ask for forgiveness, we always receive repentance from him. And this can be life changing. And we need to hang on to these three characteristics that he, his amazing grace, his love for us, and his forgiveness for us. Well, let's look at our scripture today. And because it's so short, I'm just going to read it all at one time. And then we're going to go through the story of Peter. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, you also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now, when this passage starts, remember they had just been in the Garden of Gethsemane. And remember that um, in the midst of the mob and everything, that someone, most people say it was Peter, had cut off a high priest's ear. And in the midst of everything that was happening, Jesus reached over and he healed that ear. He showed compassion. He told his followers, no, you don't do violence. You treat with love and respect. So it's really clear here that Jesus had intervened. He had stopped the, the violence and the disciples had scattered from the garden, probably because they were fearing for their lives. But Peter Instead of running like the rest of the disciples, he had enough courage that at least he stayed behind, um, but he stayed at a distance. And the group took Jesus to the house of the Jewish high priest, and Peter sat and he watched where they were taking him, and he slipped into the courtyard and he joined this mob that was sitting there in the courtyard. And this is where the story of today's lesson takes place. Now, we had heard or we had read, we had studied that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, he had left his disciples to pray and he went and prayed fervently. And remember when he came back that the disciples were asleep um, and he woke them up. The mob came in, they took Jesus to the high priest's house. Um, now, Annas and Caiaphas had been the high priest. Now, Annas had been appointed the high priest in Jerusalem about 6 AD, and he had been appointed by a Roman um, governor of Syria by the name of Quirinius, and he reigned from about 6 AD to 15 AD, which was about nine years. Well, then he was forcefully removed from office, and his son-in-law, Caiaphas, took the position, and Caiaphas served as high priest in Jerusalem from about 18 to 37 AD, which was about 19 years. Now, you would think that if Annas had been forcefully removed, that he would be in the background and wouldn't have anything to say, but that was not true. He had a considerable influence over the people in Jerusalem, and he was probably the very first one to interrogate Jesus. Now, probably the 
uh, mob had taken Jesus to Caiaphas' residence because his residence would have been large enough to have all of the members of the Sanhedrin there um, who had come to judge Jesus. Now, remember, Peter's fallen at a distance, and perhaps Peter is remembering what Jesus had said to him um, when he had rebuked him because he had cut off the high priest's ear, and he had previously boasted that he would die with Jesus. Now, Peter's got these thoughts kind of running around his ear. Now, what's going to happen? Is he going to die for Jesus? Did he still hear these echoes in his mind of Jesus' prediction of his denial? We don't know that, but we can look at Peter from the standpoint of being a human and think this may have been happening. He kept his physical distance from Peter, I mean from Jesus. Oh, his physical distance was small, but his spiritual distance right now was huge. How many times is our spiritual distance from Jesus huge? How many times do we fail to pray, to read his word, and to, to stay in close contact with him? We can be just as guilty of Peter as having a huge distance from Jesus. Now it's morning. There's a group sitting in the courtyard. It must have been pretty chilly because they built a fire, so that probably indicated that they planned on staying there for a while. Now, they sat down around the fire. They were at a distance. Um, there was a group that was sitting there. Now, think if you were Peter and you had followed at a distance. Um, the mob may not have gotten a good look at you. I have a feeling Peter was probably keeping his head down. He was not looking at anyone in the eye. He was trying to remain very inconspicuous. He could have even had his head covered, perhaps with like today's hoodie, um, over his head. He just did not want anybody to see him. But yet, he wanted to know what was happening to Jesus. He had been traveling with Jesus. He had been his buddy for three years. He had observed Jesus. He had learned from Jesus. He had ministered with Jesus. He had watched Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he had been taken as a criminal. He had tried to defend him, but instead of defending him, Jesus had rebuked him. So he was fearful. He was uncertain. He didn't know what to do. He wanted to help Jesus, but he didn't want to experience what was happening to Jesus. So what could he do? He just didn't know. Jesus' call to all of us demands that we love him more than others, including ourselves. We're called to follow him, regardless of whatever the cost is. And I hope and pray that we never, ever spiritually distance ourselves from him and the life that he's given us to live. So we're in the courtyard. There's people all around us. Peter is trying to remain inconspicuous. There's the high priest, his household workers are probably walking around in the courtyard looking at all this mob that's there. The courtyard was part of the high priest's villa, and it was enclosed more than likely by a high wall. So anybody that hadn't been in that courtyard on a um, frequent basis the servants may have realized this, and all of a sudden, a female servant looked at Peter, and she recognized him. But you know how you see somebody in the grocery store, and you recognize them, but you can't figure out where you know them from? Perhaps they're dressed differently. They're not in their normal place of where you see them. I think that servant woman was kind of like us in the grocery store trying to figure out how we know someone. She thought that she'd seen him, but suddenly she remembered that she had seen Peter with Jesus. And she came up to him and in a pretty accusing tone said, you're one of his followers. Well, can you imagine when she made that accusation that everything in the courthouse got very quiet? And they all looked at her, and they all looked at Peter to see what was going to happen. Now remember, what is Jesus taught? What 
did he teach his disciples and what does he teach us? That we are to be the light of the world and that we are to let our light shine before others so that they can see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. Now, that's what Peter had been taught. That's what we are taught. So all this mob is looking at Peter when this servant woman looks at him and accuses him of being with Jesus. Oh, I'm sure Peter just wanted to, as we say, go through the floor. He felt everybody staring at him, and he felt the hostility in the, the mob. He had a rush of fear and he didn't know what to do. And then just as Jesus had pre uh, predicted, Satan sifted Peter like wheat. And Peter said, woman, I do not know him. Now think about what these words meant. First of all, he was saying, I don't know him, period. And second of all, he was saying, I am not a follower. Now, remember, this is the same Peter that had identified Jesus earlier as the Messiah. And now he's denying Peter to a woman saying, I don't know him. I'm not a follower. But yet he had told his master, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and death. Peter's faith was very weak just as, as Jesus had predicted it. Now let's compare Peter's faith to Jesus's faith. Now here's Jesus's accusers, the Sanhedrin, the high priest, and Pontius Pilate. They're making all these accusations against Jesus. His faith is unwavering. But yet here's Peter with a servant woman someone of low social status accusing him and he says no he couldn't stand up against her accusation he couldn't face the fear that he was feeling right then he didn't have any courage to stand up and admit that he knew jesus and that he was a follower of jesus instead he acted with panic and dishonesty he told a lie because he wanted to avoid fear and he wanted to avoid the consequences of what the truth would have been. If he told a lie, maybe he could stay there in the courtyard, see what was going on and not be harmed. But if he told the truth, he would probably be arrested and set, face the same fate as Jesus, even though he had just told Jesus he would stay with him until death. Jesus had told Peter, or had called Satan, the father of lies. Truth can be very costly when we speak the truth and when we act the truth. Today, we can lose friends when we speak the truth. We can lose our jobs when we speak the truth. We can be shunned by family members when we speak the truth. And of course, in today's society, man, can we be slammed on social media when we speak the truth. Even acts of violence have come against people who have stood up to speak the truth. Have we failed to be the courageous disciple? Have we remained silent when we should have taken a stand? Have we failed? given up the chance to witness to somebody when we should have? Have we lied or concealed our faith to protect ourselves or to protect the things that we love? We face a day when our com a commitment to Christ is severely being tested. Are we going to be Peter and deny him? Or will we let our light shine so that others can see the glorious works? Peter sat there. He's denied Jesus once, and a man comes up to him, and a man accuses him of being the follower of Jesus. And what does Peter say? Man, I am not. His courage is diminishing greatly. Now think back. He was happy to stand with Jesus when he was healing people. He was proud to stand with him when he was standing in the tabernacle teaching, but now not so much. He's denied him once again. 
You know, it's easy to identify being a Christian when we're around Christians. It's sometimes it's not so easy to identify being a Christian when we're surrounded by people who are not Christians. Only God knows how many Christians have given their lives for him. But we know that they are with, with their God and they're okay. Now, about an hour passed and the third accusation came. And this was a relative of Malpus, who was the high priest's servant that Peter had cut off his ear. And he came up to him, and he accused him of being a follower of Jesus. Now, this time, Peter really gets mad. Peter says, man, I don't know what you're talking about. If you go back into Matthew and Mark's gospel, they say that Peter even began to curse and to swear. He's really getting angry at this point. This is three times that he has denied Jesus. His lies had escalated. Judas had betrayed Jesus to his enemies, but now Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, has denied him not once, not twice, but three times. But look at the difference. Judas faced so much remorse until the next morning he hung himself. But look at what happens to Peter. The rooster crows three times, Peter is overcome with remorse. As Jesus is being led out by the crowd, his eyes look at Peter's. Oh, don't you imagine the intense emotion that passed between Peter and Jesus in those few moments? Such powerful eyes of emotion. Peter had told Jesus how much he loved him, how much he would follow him. He had argued with the other disciples that he would be the last of them to fall. He would do anything to be with Jesus. And now, as he looks in Jesus's eyes, he saw such disappointment. He saw such utter sadness. And he remembered what Jesus had told him. Jesus had told him he would deny him. He had told him his faith would fail. Jesus knew it, but Peter didn't. But now he realized that what Jesus had told him was true. But yet, Jesus loved Peter despite his denials, and he was not ready to give up on him. So Peter went outside, and he wept bitterly, and he began to grieve over his failure to live up to the kind of person he should have been. He didn't try to make excuses. He took responsibility for his behavior. There are two times, two ways, that sometimes when we fall like Peter, we can say, I'm sorry. But what we're really saying is, I'm sorry I got caught. And then we can be like Peter. We can say, I'm sorry. And truly, truly have a repentant spirit. What would we do? Would we be Judas and hang ourselves? Would we be Peter and just grieve and weep and beg and be so sorry for what we have done? Peter's grief was so intense that it eventually led him to seek for the Lord's forgiveness and restoration. Now, later on, I'm just going to give you a little snippet of what happened. If you remember, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. He asked him again, Peter, do you love me? Peter said again, yes, Lord, I love you. He said, feed my, feed my sheep. He asked him the third time. Don't you think there's some significance there between the three times that Jesus asked Peter, did he love him and to feed his sheep and the denial that Peter had of Jesus for three times? We can all fail, but we can be so thankful for God's grace. Sometimes when we see someone who is a Christian and they do things that we know are not within God's word, we're quick to condemn them. We want to write them off. 
But Paul reminds us that we are to restore a sin, brother or sister, with gentleness. The same way that Jesus showed compassion and gentleness in the midst of a mob when Peter had cut off the ear. We must be vigilant, lest we deny Jesus the same as Peter did. We must be vigilant in what we do and in what we say and in our actions. We must be courageous to identify with Jesus, especially when we're confronted by those who don't agree. I want to close our lesson with just giving you a little, a few statistics. At least 327 million Christians face persecution according to aid in the church in need. One out of seven people facing oppression live in a country of persecution. 260 million Christians in the top 50 countries on open door experience high levels of persecution, torture, rape, sexual slavery, forced conversion, murder, and genocide, which is an increase of 6% from 2019. 60% of those enduring persecution are children. Women and girls are most violated. Open Doors estimates that one in nine of the world's Christians experience high levels of persecution in the top 50 countries where it's most dangerous to be a Christian. In the top 50 persecuted countries this past year, 2,983 Christians were killed for their faith. 9,488 churches and other Christian buildings were attacked, and 3,711 believers were detained without trial, they were arrested, sentenced, or imprisoned. For at least 68% of the Christians being persecuted, the driving factor is adherence to shahara, that's Islam's brutality or brutally repressive, and supremest law. Folks, we are living in different times. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, we can look at so many people and say they've denied you. They didn't stand up and admit that they were a Christian. But, Lord, we fell so short. There are so many times when we need to speak up, and yet we don't. Maybe we don't deny you openly like Peter who said, man, I don't know him, but we silently deny you by not speaking up. Lord, let us be bold. Let us always, always be proud of our Christianity and be willing to share the Christ that we serve because you are such a loving and forgiving and amazing God. Let us always lift you up. And let us be the light into the world that you have asked us to be. For it's in your most precious name I pray. Amen.